Good afternoon, friends. Well, finally, we beat those dreaded gremlins of YouTube that every now and again are sent to hound us streaming producers with a lot of nonsense. I tried to start this meeting about 30 minutes ago, actually 34 minutes ago. So I've been struggling to join YouTube streaming because, you know, those of you who stream, you know that it's got this camera and that camera has got options and you can stream using your phone or your laptop straight away. So I decided to go for the easy option instead of dealing with all the codes and stuff, but it just didn't work. So I apologize for that on behalf of YouTube the gremlins of YouTube. Well, let's get started with today's meeting. Right off the bat, I got a question in from one of our students, Maya, who has got the exam coming up in 10 days. And the question was, Phil, what should I do if my exam is coming up in 10 days? It's very similar to other videos that I've got out there on YouTube. If you have your exam in 10 days, you gotta go through the checklist of every single input, tool and technique, sub tool and technique, and output. So Maya, I wanna encourage you to go to page 686 if you haven't already done that in your studying. You wanna to go to page 686 and you wanna go through all of those tools and techniques with a fine tooth comb, one by one. Okay, you wanna comb through all of that stuff. You've got data gathering tools and techniques, for example, on page 686. But don't just read it at a high level, go into the details, using this as a checklist. So table X6-1, you need to use that as your checklist to go through all the sub tools, all the sub techniques until you get to page 694. So that's for the tools and techniques. Now there's a similar page for some of the key documents and outputs from planning, and that's on page 89. So page 89, you've got most of the very important project management documents, if not all of them. I think there, there are a few that are not here but for the project management plan components, they are all here. So page 89, you need to go through that with a fine tooth comb and wherever it's referred to in the PMBOK guide, wherever any of those items is referred to, I would suggest that you open it up and you read that, okay? So that would be my suggestion to anyone who is taking the exam in the next 10 days, page 89, use it as a checklist page 686 all the way down to 694, <clears throat> excuse me, use that as a checklist and it will greatly help you. So bear with me, I'm gonna to try to get some of the other folks who may have been on the other page, not knowing that we are actually on a different page. So I'm gonna try and pass that message across to anyone who may be hanging around on that page. Yeah, let's do that. All right, so for you guys, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to chat the questions in because that's really what I'm here for. I'm not here to lecture you about stuff you already know in the PMBOK guide. What I really wanna to do today is go over any questions that you have about the PMP exam, anything bothering your mind, anything that has not allowed you to take the exam, I would like to address those. You know, there are pretty much two people who are affiliated with the PMP exam or two people associated with the PMP exam. Those that will never take the exam and those that will. And my question to you is, are you one of those who will never take the exam? Because I've been doing this for quite a while. It's going to a decade. I've been doing nothing but training project management professional certification. Um, before that, 
I did a lot of other program and project management stuff, the daily grind of project management. But for the past 10 years, you know, starting 2009, it was early 2009, rude awakening, the economy tanked, and my boss's boss called me into his office because my boss had abandoned ship. So my boss's boss calls me into his office and says, do you know why you're here? <laughs> And in my mind, I thought, well, maybe to give me a promotion. I don't know. Why am I here? Says, well, Phil, you know how the economy is. Today's your last day. Go to your office, pack up your stuff. That's it. I'm like, what? So, <laughs> rude awakening, you know, look for a job for nine solid months. Nine months. Couldn't find a job. Went for a lot of interviews, banging down doors, but it just wouldn't cut it. The economy had tanked, you know. 2008, 2009, miserable period. You know, so at the end of the day, when nothing was forthcoming, I decided, well, since I've already started doing this part-time, I might as well just go into it full-time. What's the point? <laughs> What's the point still looking for a job? So after the last frustrating interview, um, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to help project managers pass the exam. And I'd already started doing this, but I decided I would do it fully. So I said all that to let you know there are two types of people that are associated with the whole idea about the PMP. They are those people who know about the exam, who have been to a boot camp, who are studying, but they will never take the exam. And they're those people who have done the same, gone for a boot camp, studied, and they will take the exam and pass the exam ultimately. But those people who will never take the exam, there's a reason why they will never take the exam. Because they procrastinate and it gets to the point where they feel, what's the point? I don't need it anymore. It's trivial. I've done without it. And telling themselves all sorts of stories, you know. So my question to you is, which one of the, these people are you? Are you the person who is definitely 100% sure, unmovable, unshakable in that resolve to take the exam? Or are you one of those people who is like, oh, okay, I'm going to take it. And then you fall off the wagon. You're like, oh, I don't need to. There are a lot of people. And, you know, it just makes me so frustrated for these folks that they have put 120 hours of their life into a boot camp. Some of them attend my boot camps. They come for a five day boot camp and I tell them, do you know you're putting 24 hours into this thing daily? You're putting 24 hours into this attempt because you come to the boot camp on Monday, you go back, you sleep, you come back the next morning, but everything you do over that 24 hour cycle is geared at, oh, I need to finish the boot camp. I need to finish the boot camp. You finish the boot camp, you get trained, and then you don't take the exam. You know, the more frustrating part of it, some of these people, they actually don't even take our mock exam. Because what we assure the PMI about in our training for the PMP is before we cut anyone loose, we're going to make sure that they pass a four hour mock exam, a full length mock exam. So you don't pass our mock exam, you're not going to get a certificate to show the PMI. And it's worked very well because it's, we're able to weed out a lot of the unserious folks who are just in it because everyone else is doing it. They're like, okay, they're doing it in my firm. Let me just come along for the ride. And they have no intention of following through and they don't take the mock exam and they just blew 120 hours of their life. That's horrible. Don't do that. I would rather you went for a one hour. Hey, I would rather you took my project management basics course on YouTube than come for a boot camp for the PMP and not follow through. Because it's a waste of your energy, your time, your company's money, resources. Don't do it. If you don't want to get certified, don't go for a boot camp. Go for like project management basics with fail on YouTube. It will only take you 77 episodes, each one about five to 10 minutes. So the PMP exam is not a game, you know? It's very, very hard for people to find the time. I'm not even talking about to get through the content. I'm not talking about to get through the content. I'm just talking about for people to find the time to study. It's often a challenge. 
So I want to encourage you, if you really truly mean business with the PMP exam and you're in it for the long haul, just plan out when you're going to take this exam. Put that date on your calendar. You know, if you're not putting a date on your calendar, you're just like one being blown by the wind of time. You know, oh, there's no time to take it for the next two months, three months. You don't have it on your calendar fixed. You need to have it fixed. The same with anything you want to do in life. Just decide, okay, this date, this is my go date. You know, your go or no go should have already passed. You should have decided, okay, I'm going for it. Or I'm not going for it. Some people say I'm not going for it. And that's all right. You know, some people have gone for it and they say, I don't want to do it anymore. And they let their PMP lapse. And I admire those people for deciding that's what they want to do. But for you who's studying for the exam, I want you to commit. All right. So for Maya, who's, who's getting ready to kill it, put in everything. Go that final mile. It's just the final mile. Page 89, page 686. Hit those hard, okay? And then go through every data flow diagram in the PMBOK guide. Every data flow diagram, for, there are 49 of them, obviously. Go through all of them, study them, and make sure you are aware of the core outputs of each process that do not appear anywhere else or may only appear in maybe one or two places. You know, so I'm talking about things like deliverables, accepted deliverables, verified deliverables, issue log, so on and so forth. And tools and techniques that are not common everywhere, like, like design for X, um, product analysis, um, facilitated workshops, focus groups, prototypes, things that may appear in one or two places, but not everywhere. Those are the things I would really hone in on. You know, and one of the things I've heard from quite a few students, and including my experience, I've discovered that the tools and techniques seem to be a lot harder than the inputs and outputs majorly because the inputs and outputs have names that give them away very easily and call your, your recall your memory to where you saw them but the tools and techniques you got some abstract and random names and terms that um, if you haven't studied those things you don't really know what they are you know and now that they're all grouped and bunched together in different chunks of data representation, data gathering, data analysis, it becomes even harder to distinguish one from another. So my suggestion would be hone in on those. Um, you also want to watch the video that I came out with yesterday, Maya, that talks about your areas of concentration on the exam. So executing is 31% of the exam. Obviously, 10 processes you want to focus on very heavily. Initiating, you've got two processes, 13%. That's low hanging fruit again. And closing a, a whopping 7% for one process. That's the most, the highest weighted process in the entire PMBOK guide for the exam. So you definitely want to pay attention to initiating, closing, executing. Everything else, of course, pay close attention to, but I'm saying those three, that's 55% of your exam in how many? 10, 13, 13 processes. That is, that is something to be aware of. 13 processes gives you 55% of the exam. Wow. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Or did I say 51%? I beg your pardon. 51 because it's 13 plus 7 plus 31. So it's a lot nonetheless. Okay. Over half of the exam for, for just 13 processes. All right, so Maya, that's my suggestion to you. Follow those things. I'm going to be putting up another video after this that also talks about integration and how integration is very heavily weighted on the exam. Integration is seven processes, but watch this. If you do the maths, you add them up, 25% of your exam is from integration if you really do the maths. There's 25% on the table for just seven processes. So it becomes very important to read integration, the performing a graded change control process, a beast. Um, direct and manage project work and manage project knowledge together, beastly, you know. And then the ones I mentioned on either end, develop project charts or close project or phase. By the time you mix all of the processes and integration together, it could be pretty bad. 
All right, what's that? Emergency alert. Yeah, it's pretty crazy in Arizona. Lots of rain and flash floods and all sorts of things going on right now. So anyway, um, no wonder that's going off. So um, if you guys have any questions right now, in addition to what I'm, I've been answering, I would really... Oh, I saw some chats. I'm sorry, Maya. So thank you for chatting in. I'm just seeing a few of these chats. And Heath and Carlos. <laughs> good to see you guys. Very, very good. Okay, look, so let me answer these questions one by one. So Maya, how to use that page 89? For every single item on page 89, you need to be like a detective asking yourself, where do these people live? What are their names? Where do they live? And what do they do for me in the project? So what does scope management, what does a scope management plan do for you? What does a requirements management plan do for you? On and on. And then watch this. This is the big one. What do each of those have in them? Let, let me take one for example. This is one people often think they know until they get into the detail and like, oh, <laughs> I actually don't know that. So I'm, I'm talking about the resource management plan. This thing is, is quite significant. A lot of people just glaze over it. Oh yeah, it's managing resources. But you have to know what's in it. Let me read this for you really, really quick. Oh, and as I read this for you, I'm gonna show you some of the hidden information that people often mistake for just background noise, but it's not. So, so let me go to page 318 in your PMBOK guide, first of all, and let, let me read what's in it. It says, the resource management plan is the component of the project management plan that provides guidance on how project resources should be categorized, allocated, managed, and released. It may be divided between the team management plan, and someone says, Phil, what on earth is a team management plan? Well, it's here. You need to go investigate it. This is what I'm talking about. Did you know there was a team management plan? And it says, watch this, physical resource management plan. And someone says, I've never heard those terms before. Of course you haven't, because you've not dived as deep as you need to into the guide. This is what I call dissecting the information. So those two plan names, team management plan and physical resource management plan, can you imagine coming across those on the exam in a dark alley? <laughs> scare you out of your wits if you haven't read this stuff and then it says the resource management plan may include but is not limited to and I'm gonna read these very quick identification of resources how you're gonna identify and quantify physical and human resources this tells you how how you're gonna acquire resources what about the roles and responsibilities what about authority competence all this stuff is talked about project org charts just read what it says about org charts a project organization chart is a graphic display of project team members and their reporting relationships it can be formal or highly detailed or broadly framed based on the needs of the project for example the org chart for a 3,000 person disaster response team will have greater detail than a project org chart for an internal 20 person project so if someone is taking the exam and encounters org charts and doesn't know it's part of this plan, it, there could be trouble here. And then going further, it says project team resource management, training, team development, resource control, recognition plan. Someone said, Phil, what's a recognition plan? You see, I've just shown you three plans that people are probably oblivious about if they haven't had a deep dive into each plan. So recognition plan, physical resource management plan, and team management plan. Those are three plans that if you saw them on the exam, will they scare you out of your wits? So that's why I tell people page 89, it's not enough to just whiz past it and say, oh yeah, I know that one. Well, how well do you know it? Do you know the details? You see, the thing about the sixth edition is it has a lot of buried landmines all throughout the guide. It ha has a lot of things that people may think they have read, but trust me, a lot of people don't know. So they go into the exam and find some strange terms and they're like, oh, I'm, 
I'm just going to pass on that one. There's no way that one's in the PMBOK guide. It's probably a pretest question. No, it's not. It's right there. So my, my suggestion is every plan on page 89, you have to do what I've just done. Intentionally read them. Highlight them. Look for stuff that you don't know, just in case it's buried into a question, you see? And also for the project documents, the same thing. I want you to go through every document. I want you to know, for example, activity attributes. Let's take a trip to chapter six. That is the very first one of the project documents listed. So if you go to activity attributes, which is on page 186, of course, of your favorite book, those of you who are just arriving, activity attributes has a boatload of stuff. But do you know that stuff detail like this? It could be on the exam, you see. WBSID, someone said no, WBSID is from scope. It can't be an activity attribute. Yes, it is, it's here, you see. During the initial stages of the project, these activity attributes include the unique identifier ID, WBSID, activity label or name, and when completed, they may include activity descriptions, predecessor activities, sucks. You see, all of this stuff is the detail. This is the final finish, Maya, that I'm looking for you to complete. So in your big run-up, Maya, I've told you like a bunch of things, but I can categorize them at a high level. You want to hone in on page 89. You want to dissect page 89, maybe even take a fresh you know, pair of notes, so fresh pad of notes for everything on, on page 89. Detailed. You, you need to go very, very deep and detailed. It's a final comb through to make sure that you, you delineate all of these plans because it could get very mixed up on the exam. So dissect one thing from the other. The same thing for page 686 to 694. You got to dissect them. What makes affinity diagrams different from something else? Um, from a Pareto chart? I don't know. Or from um, what is similar to that? Or from a mind map? You know? What, what makes one tool and technique under the same grouping different from the other? Let me, let me see if I can give you some more specific examples here. Because you've been on this journey for a while, haven't you? And I'm. It's got, it, Maya, is it going to like at least eight months you've been on this journey, if not, if not going to 11 months? If, if my memory serves me right, tell me, tell me how long you've been doing this thing because you've been on this journey for a while, haven't you? You see, so under data gathering, benchmarking versus um, anything else, brainstorming. Oh, wait, this is a good one. Check sheets versus checklist. So for things like that that seem very subtle, a checklist is just a list. A check sheet is used to collect data. You see, your checklist is reminding you about things you need to do, but your check sheet is where you're actually storing stuff. See? And there are many like that. There's so many. Um, under data analysis, that's one of the worst. You see, there are all sorts of analyses under data analysis and those need to be understood. I, I hope you get what I'm saying. Let me get let me get off this soapbox. So I hope that helps. Is there any sequence for how to perform closing? So Maya, look, you need to go to this um, website. Let me type this in here. Um, um, PMP failure. Okay. Go to this um, link, Maya, and I have roughly three hours. Hey, Biren, good to see you. How you doing and how's your PMP prep channel coming along? So yeah, I, I actually visited your channel, Biren, and I saw the advert for CAPM. You're helping the PMI. Do you work for the PMI? <laughs> you're, you're helping broadcast the, the CAPM. Very nice of you, I'm joking. It's all good. All right, so take a look at that link, uh, Maya. The link that I have there, <laughs> I see Jake Paul and, <laughs> and Biren just joking about in the chat. You're so funny. Okay. So anyway, take a look um, at that link, Maya. That link has got a bunch of videos. And one of the videos I recommend is a closing video because it explains 
what exactly is going on in closing. You know, basically anyone, all of you, Carlos, um, I said Heath, health correction, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my glasses are now on. Okay. Um, everyone, everyone who is trying to get this thing done, go to that link. I call it PMP exam failure stamp out. Okay. Go take a look. And I, I think that will help you um, regarding the um, closing questions. Okay. So health correction, should we prepare for net present value questions, calculations for the PMP exam? How about IRR? These are referenced, but not detailed. Very good. Great question. So for MPV, I mean, it's a very straightforward formula. Know your present value is equal to future value divided by one plus the interest rate, which is really more like the IRR raised to the power of N. Um, if you understand that formula and you understand that over a time period of, let's say, 10 years, you need to find each and each present value and add them up to get the net present value. And don't forget the initial investment, which will be negative. Um, if you follow that, it's so straightforward. Um, I, I want to tell you this, that in the past five years, I've had my ear down to the ground, especially social media, the LinkedIn group, PMI LinkedIn group you don't really hear people crying about MPV. Now, there might be the odd one or two people that said, oh, I had an MPV question as my first one, you know, and I had to use the formula. So what that tells me is just have the formula in your back pocket, you know. Anyone who doesn't know the NPV formula but has been exposed to it, I'd say it's a bit of a gamble. Why wouldn't you just know the formula? It's not gonna take anything away. So I would say know the formula, be ready for it if it shows up. If it does not show up, in my mind, the only other thing regarding MPV that could show up is questions such as, um, you've got four projects. The MPV of one is, is 35,000. MPV of two is two million. MPV of three is five million. MPV of four is 50 million. Which one would you choose? 50 million, obviously. That would be the logic. Now, in instances where NPV is combined with IRR and other things, because no other metric is like NPV. You see, NPV considers everything. It considers the time value of money. It considers the interest rate, the number of years, the whole kit and caboodle. It makes sense to use NPV over BCR or IRR. But in instances where you have questions, I try to badger you into just IRR, so they give you four projects with different IRRs, always choose the highest. BCR, always choose the highest value. You know, net present value, always choose the highest. And instances where they try to confuse you by mixing them together, just know that a BCR of 20 could mean, okay, I'm getting 20 cents. You know, it could be the ratio of benefits or revenue to cost is, is 20. Maybe it's 20 cents versus a cost of one cent. But MPV will tell you if it's $20 or $5 or $50. MPV is very conclusive. So my suggestion to anyone who is a bit confused will be to first of all know your MPV, okay? Know your MPV and then in addition to MPV, know everything else and know that MPV is the boss, MPV is king. You know, if you don't have your MPV in the question, you can go with the other things. But if MPV is presented, that would always be the best. So for example, what should you do? Project A, BCI is 50. Uh, project B, IRI is 20%. Project C, payback period is one year. Project D, MPV is $20. No matter how low the MPV is, is if it's a positive value, you wanna go with the MPV. So those are the kind of questions um, that I have seen in mock exams. And as far as the real exam, the noise levels that I've heard in the past, not in the not recently, but in the past, it has really bordered more on um, that formula, you know, present value equals future value divided by one plus I um, in brackets to the power of N, and then applied over um, however many time periods are in discussion. And just look out for trickery, you know, trickery and things such as trying to mask the initial investment, you know, in a bunch of numbers. Maybe they won't give it to you straight. Maybe you'll have to calculate that. But I really doubt that you will get something like that. Okay. 
Carlos, my good friend, it's so good to hear from you. So, Carlos, when are you going to kill this thing, bro? It's been going on for like a year now. Let's let's execute Pimpy. Let's <laughs> let, let's make a brave heart movie of Pimpy. How about that? Okay. So I'm glad it's sunny in Florida. It's very gloomy in Arizona today. Um, my problem lately is getting my key stakeholders. <laughs> Getting my key stakeholders at home to buy into the project. Every time I start working on the project, <laughs> you, you need to find a way of getting your stakeholders engaged. Get your stakeholders engaged. Hey, I've got, I've got a suggestion. How about beginning to introduce some incentives? Every time you test me on a chapter, I reward you with, I don't know, an ice cream, something that they like that would be my suggestion or maybe how about an afternoon over the weekend chilling out some picnic fun and while everyone else is having their fun you get one of your stakeholders to quiz you so you're, you're taking them to have fun but you're putting in time and you're pulling each one of them away from the fun for you know maybe 10 minutes 20 minutes and after each one of them is done they, they return and come back to quiz you you got to make it interesting. Your stakeholders are just tuned out. You know, like one of my one of my students out in Canada, he actually made it fun for his kids, and they're very competitive. So his kids ended up knowing the ITTOs more than he did. <laughs> Let's say, Dad, you failed that one. It's not that it's activity list. And anyway, he got to the point where he was able to kill the exam. If he's listening, he knows I'm talking about him. The hotel manager out of Canada that was trying to change career. But um, his kids really helped him. All right, next question is from Maya. Closing is really confusing. Maya, I put down that link. Go check out that link, okay? PMP exam failure stamp out. Watch all the videos. Because what I did is I took the PMP exam content outline and I broke it down piecemeal into every process. So anyone getting ready for the exam, that's the link. Uh, type in the link again. Go check the link out. Okay. All right. Mr. Jake Paul. <laughs> Jake, are you a PMP to be or what are you? <laughs> he said, just forget it and, and go grab yourself a cold beer. Hey, hey, don't, Jake, don't let me go off on my, my beer rant. I can probably do a better job than Matt Damon. <laughs> so don't <laughs> don't get me started on that. You, you you don't want to get me started. Okay, Shri, the link that is above what you just um, typed in, that link that is right above. Okay, awesome, awesome, very good. Um, Maya says there is no formula given for cost plus contracts <laughs> in the pen book guide and other books. Is there any chance that we'll get... Ah, oh dear, where do I even start? Don't Look, Maya, you're putting up a soapbox for me to get on. Don't let me get on this soapbox because I probably won't get off it. There are a lot of fictitious questions that people make up trying to terrorize poor students that they'll get such things on the exam. The gamut of questions that I believe you could get that are contract based. First of all, I wouldn't say that a whole ton of them are numeric. And those that are numeric, from what I know, you probably will be able to apply these with good old common sense. You know, good old common sense about the devaluation of a product or a service over a period of time. So you buy this commodity or you buy this widget, and over the next five years, it will devalue by $20 or two hundred dollars the scrap value is this how much you know would be left or you know questions such as your project manager on a manufacturing plant project um, you have two options of buying or leasing leasing costs this 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 um, buying costs this is this if you want to if you want to sell at the end of the day you pay this amount um, the lease has no penalty for leaving Scenarios such as that, which one should you do, lease or buy? It's basically a make or buy. So a lot of the instructors who train this stuff, 
I think they're idle because they make up a lot of bogus questions that never even come out on the exam, just terrorize poor students. They're scrambling for the hills. Oh, net, oh, not net present value, PTA. The sky is falling on PTA. What does it even stand for? The point of total assumption. Sometimes I just want to forget it. I don't even want to assume it's coming out on the exam. Talk about assumption. But PTA, a lot of poor students killing themselves doing the goofy old target price, ceiling price. Don't waste your time, folks. Those types of questions are long gone. I mean, this was back in 2011, and people are still trying to ram it down people's throats today. Don't waste time on that. Don't waste time, because it's a very convoluted formula to start with, and you're going to have to delete some kilobytes, megabytes of space in your hard drive to store that one. Waste of time. So anything regarding the PTA, the point of total assumption, my advice will be know what it is at a high level. It is that point in the cost curve where the seller assumes all of the cost, all of the cost responsibilities. And it's pretty much synonymous with the P FPIF. That is the gamut of what I expect you to know. So all of those other goofy contracts that are outside of the basic straight ahead make or buy, nah, don't waste your time on it. All right, that would be my suggestion. All right, you are most welcome, health correction. Okay, so let me read Maya's um, question one more time. There are no formulas for cost plus. Yeah, don't waste your time on that stuff. Um, is there any chance we'll get, I very much doubt it, like I said, okay? And even for FPIF, point of total assumption, people who know how the PMI work these days, people who are attentive, they know that that is a waste of time, a waste of the poor student's time. You know, and, and this, is, this is from years of training this stuff. You know, there were actually students who said, Phil, why did you waste my time with MPV? <laughs> because I didn't get a single question. But um, around 2016, the PMI started talking about feasibility studies again. And knowing what your business case is, you know, as an economic feasibility study, we decided it wouldn't harm to at least have one or two questions hanging around. But when it comes to full-blown formulas that are very technical, like the point of total assumption and all that stuff, no. Because once upon a time, we had the point of total assumption questions on our mock exam. And the noise levels would increase as each student took the exam. They just say, Phil, what a waste of, what a waste of five hours of my life because I studied this and it was a waste. So the, the more the noise levels went up amongst our students and on social media, it was a no brainer that this is a waste of time. All right. This session should be recorded automatically by um, YouTube, hopefully. Very good question. Maya says, is WAS part of the charter? No, the WAS would not be part of the charter. This would be part of the in-house systems for conducting work. Actually, let's take a look for authorizing work here. This would be this would be something that you would be more concerned about as e executing draws close. So I don't even think they have it here. They don't even have it here anymore, unfortunately. Let me let me go to the index and see if work authorization system is here. Wow, have they taken this out of the PMBOK guide? My oh my. So the work authorization system is a system for authorizing work, um, the timing of the work and the sequence of the work. So yeah, this is not covered to my knowledge. Let me take a quick look just to kick the tires here. But yeah, this wouldn't be something I would imagine in, in the project charter, but I could be wrong. So let me, let me just take a cursory overview. You know, we learn every day. So I don't see anything to that degree. You, you see, the authorization of the project manager is one thing, but a WAS, I would, I would be considering that to be more of um, the direct and managed project work process. So direct and managed project work is where I would expect to see um, some discussion about a work authorization system. So let me just flip the page and see if this is here. And if you know where it is, Maya, let me know, and then we can compare notes. 
and I can give you some better direction but um, this has never been part of the of the project charter to my knowledge um, let's see direct and manage project work Okay, I would I would definitely expect this to be more around direct and manage project work, and yeah, that is a very interesting question, Maya. So I'll open up my electronic PMBOK guide, and I'll see if um, work authorization system comes up anywhere, and I'll let you know if it does. But for now, I would say this is something I would expect you know, to be in operation more in executing. But the system should already be in place, in my mind, within the organization, even before the project starts. And if there's meant to be any changes to how a particular project authorizes work, then I expect it to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, but probably more in the planning stage. So let's see handled more in the planning stage to establish it and, and used in the executing stage. Work authorization system. So let me search, let's see, let's see whether anything comes up. Okay. Oh, you got one question about this? WAS, okay. Well, we don't want to spill the beans, so we're going to keep... All right, let me. so let me read this. So this is on page 77. Yeah, page 77. So this is similar to what I thought. So it's an EEF, and it says on page 38, um, examples of information technology software include scheduling software tools, configuration management systems, web interfaces to other online automated systems and work authorization systems. So that explains, you know, it's, it would be part of a PMIS, and that's why I said direct and manage project work. You know, the PMIS there would definitely contain something to this effect. So that's on page 38 of the PMBOK guide. Let me go to page 95 of the PMBOK. Yeah, there you go. It's right there in direct to manage project work. We actually flew right over it. So it says the PMIS, the Project Management Information System, provides access to information technology software tools such as scheduling software tools, work authorization systems, configuration management systems, information collection and distribution systems, as well as interfaces to other online automated systems. So the bottom line is this, organizations already have these systems in place and when the project is live, these systems are used, of course, to, to run the project and drive work, okay? So it's there on page 95. I think there's one more mention of it, Maya, so let's take a look at the final one. And this is on page 189, and it's listed as an EEF, exactly what I was saying. There you go. So this is part of sequence activities. It says the EEFs that can influence sequence activities include, and then it lists out a bunch of them, and then it mentions organization work authorization systems. So systems for conducting and sanctioning work, those have always been something that would be um, decided upon up front. All right. So I hope that answers those questions. I think I've cleared out the question queue. And I've just got um, a couple more questions to answer from some of our friends on Facebook. In fact, there's one question in particular that is about career. So let me go there and answer that question if I can find it. There are also a bunch of other questions that revolve around the PMP exam and how to get started and what to do and so on and so forth. I will answer those as well. 
but let me go to this one. Okay. So this question is from Jazz, J. Jazz Romeo. So J. Jazz Romeo, um, J. Jazz Romeo says, I have just finished my project management course. Can you tell me how I can find a good job as a fresher? And then I asked him, please give me more information about the program. Is it a degree? What is it? And he says, it's a diploma only. I have a degree in civil engineering. I want to work in this field as a PM. And then I, I asked him, did you learn any tools like Primavera or MS Project? And he says, yes, MS Project. So I, I said I would uh, take this question and then goes further to say, please do elaborate how freshers can start jobs. It's a perfect question. Well, first and foremost, you're doing the right thing, J Jazz, in that you've gotten some education, you got a diploma in project management. Okay. That's very good. That's a good starting point. That already shows any hiring manager that you have an interest for the project management profession and you're ready to learn more. Okay, so that's great. But going a step further, I would say your next line of action would be to try and get something that may be a little bit more definitive, you know, by way, by way of it being a standard, I would say, you know. Something more definitive like um, the CAPM exam, you know, I would recommend the CAPM exam majorly because you want, a, you want a certificate that is recognized, okay? You want something that people, when they look at it, it's already got the name of the PMI behind it. You know, it's got PMI's backing. So going for a diploma is cool, but my question would be, which school is it, you know? And I think you need to go above whatever school it was because the PMI is universal compared to a school. And I'm talking about any school, any college. You know, most hiring managers are gonna gravitate towards something that they know, something that they recognize, something that they feel comfortable with, something that is compatible with everything else. So you've got the diploma, that's good. That's a good first step. My next step right off the bat would be to look into the CAPM. And Biran, who was on here, on his channel, he posted the, the CAPM, the advert for the CAPM. And Biran, I don't know if you've, you've got that link to your video you posted, but the video shows, let me, let me see if I can grab this from PMI's site. Um, CAPM exam video. Um, PMI. I know it's on PMI's um, site. Oh, there we go. So that's it. Let me grab this and let me just put it in the chat. Just on the off chance that J Jazz ends up watching. But that video shows you you can take the CAPM exam at home, the comfort of your home, as long as you've got a webcam that's able to proctor monitor you for the entire exam you can take it at home which is cool um, and then when you're done with the CAPM exam at least you've got a certificate that is more universally known thereby boosting your chances of getting through the door okay so that's the second thing now since you're done with your diploma while you're working on your CAPM <clears throat> you need to be banging down doors okay now please don't do that literally <laughs> you may get in trouble but I mean, start knocking on doors, figuratively speaking, looking for potential jobs, advertising yourself as a project manager. You got to hustle. Like back in those days, I would go into any business and drop a card and hustle. It's all different now. You know, the web is there, but I would say stop at nothing. Okay. Of course, nothing within sensible reasons. 
to knock on doors and say, I'm a project manager, are you looking for anyone to help? You know, I, I often tell the story of someone who knocked on a door looking for, looking for a job, you know, with, with one of these uh, rich tycoons and said, I like a job in your company, I can do this, I can do that. And the man said, I'm sorry, there's really no job for you. And he says, there's no job right now, but I can make a job. And the man just looked at him and shook his head. Anyway, long story short, he volunteered to work for free for a period of time. And after working for free for some time, a job opened up and that's what catapulted him. So sometimes you've got to make that trade off. It's not always about the money. Sometimes it's about coming under, you know, cutting yourself, taking less money, um, taking $5, $10. Someone says, Phil, what do you mean by $10 an hour? I can't do that. Well, people volunteer. Think about it. How much is that experience and that experience on your resume really worth? So you're getting the, the physical experience of working as a project manager and you've got something on your resume that can be backed up by people. That is priceless, folks. So sometimes you need to cut yourself short, take the job, and while you're doing that job, you're also preparing for your CAPM, thereby boosting your worth, you know? Show value to the people where you're working, you know, project management, it's one of those professions where it's all about your soft skills, the leadership. And I, I've read this ad nauseum in the PMBOK guide to you, but without going into the details, the top 2% of project managers, JJAZ, are those who have great interpersonal skills. So I would say, while you're doing your CAPM, you might want to get tuned into my mentor, John C. Maxwell on YouTube, or just get the regular John Maxwell, a minute with Maxwell videos. That will really help you day by day as you listen to that stuff. Let me see if I can get um, a link to John's page here. Because I, I think if you sign up for a minute with Maxwell daily, I think that will add tremendous value. Not even think, I know it will. You know, you, you got to just do it doggedly and with a view to learning something. And I think that will really catapult you to the next level. Definitely will add value to you, but it will, it will stir up something to get you to that next level. You know, because leadership is all about influence. And if you're able to influence within your project management, you're doing the great thing. If you're not able to influence as a project manager, then you're not really doing what the profession demands. The profession demands that you lead, you know. So take a look at that, J Jazz. All right. And um, after you get CAPM certified, work as a CAPM. You're you're already an engineer, so I'm sure it will be even easier for you to get a job in a company like that than somewhere else. Like for me, you know, coming in to uh, work within the United States as a project manager, it wasn't that easy. Um, I had worked in a similar arena in a different industry outside of the US. But what really helped me find the open door was the ability to schedule, okay? So my first job in project management here in the US revolved more around scheduling and the ability to use Microsoft Project. People hate Project, I don't. I went for some courses in it, I started training Microsoft Project even before I started training PMP. And um, I got into an organization where I met my mentor who introduced me to the world of the PMI. But I started off as a Microsoft Project scheduler, scheduling some really massive projects. And it was through my abilities in project I got into that door. So that's why I was asking you, do you know any scheduling tools? If you're able to use scheduling tools really well, Microsoft Project, um, Primavera, being a civil engineer, maybe you use that. Um, Smartsheets is quite common these days. And air, all the Microsoft Office suite, if you're able to use those really well, my suggestion would be to pitch that in your resume. Let people know you're a great project management assistant. Don't pose as the project manager, but you want to pose as a great project management assistant and coordinator. And that may very well get you in the door because that's what I started doing. I started helping PMs, PMs who didn't love scheduling very much, who couldn't even 
schedule a line of their tasks to save their lives, I started helping those folks. And from there, bigger things, different things. And I wouldn't even say bigger, just different things. You know, some people are very happy scheduling. I've had colleagues who don't want to leave scheduling. They're happy. They love earn value management and scheduling and that's all their life. You know, that's what they want to do. But some people feel uncomfortable. They want to be the face to the customer, face to the stakeholder. So if that's you, I would say use this as a way of adding value to the company you're working with and also as a vehicle to learn more, offer more and get, you know, further along in your career. That's what I would recommend. Okay. <laughs> Red Bull, I've already had my share of Red Bull, Jake Paul. I had way too many Red Bulls over the weekend. Speaking of which, I should probably show you this because over the weekend, last weekend, my oh my, we had a crazy boot camp. One of the illest boot camps known to anyone getting ready for the PMP exam. <laughs> you say, why Phil? Why do you call it an ill boot camp? Well, illest is a word. You got to be hip to know what it means. It doesn't mean that anyone fell sick. It just means it was crazily good. So we we set out to have a six-hour boot camp, but we ended up having a nine-hour boot camp. And the link for those of you who are looking forward to another boot camp, who want to join the next boot camp, um, it's right there. You see it under right there under me there. So pmsucceed.com, if you look under the six hour bootcamp menu, um, you'll be able to join the next one. But it ended up being a nine hour bootcamp because folks had questions and those questions needed to be answered. So we went through every single process, every single tool, technique, input, output, process group, knowledge area. At the end of the day, our first PMP from that class got certified faith Huge shout out to you if you're watching. Um, she got certified on Monday. Had a boot camp on Saturday, aced it on Monday. So yeah, I had too many Red Bulls over the weekend. So thank you very much. Annie, good to see you. Annie definitely is one of our students. So Annie, I don't know if you remember Faith. She was having trouble coming in and joining. Well, glad to share with you she passed the exam. Annie, do you have the link? Because I sent you the link to the nine hours, well, pretty much eight hours removing the breaks, but eight hours of video. Did you get that link earlier? Because I know some people didn't get that link, but I shared that link this morning. So go to your email, take a look, watch that video again and again. And also, you know, those of you who signed up for the program, I told you I would make that available to you until you gave me what I was looking for. You paid me back with a PMP cert. So Annie, you've got a lot of, a lot of time to watch that video. And hey, the mock exam, if you look below the video in that link I've sent you, you've also got a four hour mock exam. That mock exam is a highly regarded mock exam. For the past eight years thereabouts, it has accurately predicted success on the first try. You know, so those of you who are planning on getting certified and you're like, I don't know how to ramp up. Do I go for another 35 hour boot camp? Hey, don't do that. Sign up for a lower cost, more effective boot camp. That link right there, pmsucceed.com. Look under the six hour boot camp, okay? And you'll be able to join us this weekend. Sign up, sign up, let's do it. Just like Faith. She jumped on the bandwagon. She, she'd been saying for a while, I would like to take my exam end of September. And she held true to what she promised. You know, that's why I tell people, you gotta schedule it out and you gotta work towards it. So if you've scheduled out your exam, let's, let's work towards it and get this thing done, all right? Very good, I'm glad you saw it, Annie. Awesome, awesome, very good. Very, very good. Okay, well, I think I've got a couple more very basic questions about the PMP exam. So I'm just going to read these off the site. Very basic questions. This first one says, where do I start if I want to take the PMP exam? So my suggestion would be to, first of all, start off with the PMP exam handbook. Um, read the handbook. Let me see if I can type this in for you. 
PMP exam handbook. PMP exam handbook. I'm going to type it into the chat so that anyone watching after the fact can go read it. It's, it's quite a sizable document. Take a few minutes to read it. Actually, 41 pages, so depend on how fast you read. But I would suggest reading that. It's a good place to start. Uh, the next place to start is here, <laughs> because I'm going to be answering some of those um, questions for you. So let me, let me do that. But before I do that, let me ask Mr. Sun to take a break. That is so bright. But I'm grateful with all the flash floods and bad weather we've had today. Well, I think bad is like risk. When you see bad weather, because the farmers are, they're jumping for joy. So, you know, talking about risk, like risk management, you've got two perspectives, positive and negative. To someone, it's negative. To someone, it's positive. Anyway, so... Um, read the handbook okay the next thing that is here someone says so what do i do to become a pmp so how do you become a pmp well first of all you need to prepare for the exam but before you even prepare you have to first of all qualify for the exam um so you qualify for the exam you study for the exam you pass the exam obviously um and then the follow-on question is how do i qualify for the pmp exam so to qualify, again, look at the handbook that I chatted in, read that link. But the bottom line is you need to have either a degree and three years of project management experience leading and directing projects and 35 hours of project management education. But if you don't have a degree, if you've got a high school diploma, that works. And in that category, you need to have five years and 7,500 hours leading and directing projects. So within those five years, you should have spent 7,500 hours. That's what that means. All right, um, let's see what else do we have here. Someone says, how are contact hours measured? So a contact hour is equal to one hour of project management instruction. And this could be from any of PMIs, REPs, registered education providers, like Prazion, the company behind this channel, or it could be from a non-REP. So if you went for training with a reputable company down the road, that will also uh, qualify, but you have to show proof, okay? What counts as project management experience? Experience leading and directing projects, okay? So, you know, some people often get this wrong. Some people say, well, but Phil, I was a coder, I was a tester. Well, we need to find which of your coding and testing umbrella experience was really more project management. So managing work is different from doing work. If I'm sitting at my, my desk and just typing in code, that's not project management. You're working on a project, but that is not managing the project. So that may need some finer discussions. Maybe you can hit us up and we talk about that. Um, where do I take my exam? Very good question. So for those of you who want to take your exam, I would say go to prometric.com forward slash PMI, all caps, or go to prometric.com and search for the Project Management Institute in the list of sponsors. Just follow through, put in your zip code, your country, wherever you are, and you'll find the nearest Prometric test center to you. Okay. Someone says, how should I prepare for the exam? <laughs> Come to our training and we'll get you sorted. We'll get you kitted and booted. We'll get you book, a book, a study guide, PDF if you hate lugging around heavy things. We also recommend you get one of these. So they're, you know, for our course, we recommend this, but we also recommend um, that you read our study guide, which is provided. And we've got a very interesting and comprehensive course for you to get this um, stuff done. Shri just chatted in, do we need to study the entire PMBOK before we attend your six hour boot camp? I am on scope management plan now. So Shri, in all honesty, 
It depends on your aptitude. Some people, a boot camp is going to help them to better study, you know. So the boot camp will show you the enormity of everything you have to study. However, in some of the questions, you will be lost. That is the only regrettable fact. Since there's no hurry, if you're not taking the exam like next week or the week after, my suggestion would be to probably take this boot camp when you are ready to boot the exam into shape because it is a pretty intense boot camp. Um, Annie can probably advise. Annie, do you think anyone on chapter five should attend the boot camp? What do you think? Based on what you saw on Saturday, do you, do you think anyone that has gone to chapter five will be able to survive that boot camp? I'm curious to know, you know, from a student perspective, what someone else would say. For me, I would say, probably hold off. You know, the boot camp will be very, very eye-opening and extremely helpful for people who have definitely reached the end because it's like thinking you've reached the end and then you open up Pandora's box and oh my goodness, everything, your worst nightmares, stuff that you didn't even imagine could be in the box. <laughs> they're, they're coming out of the box. You're like, my goodness, I didn't know this was in here. I, didn't, I never looked at this in this way. I had never had this perspective to risk, you know, so probably safer to go through everything to minimize shock, you know, because some folks are just overwhelmed. Thank you, Annie. Annie says, a person may get confused. It's a pretty quick pace, deep dive. And she's absolutely right. It is. It really, 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 really is. Um, maybe take it a week before the real exam. In my mind, the sweet spot will probably be two weeks so that if there are any gaps, you can close those gaps. Absolutely. Thank you, Annie. Annie hit, she hit the nail on the head. It's very rapid but it's also deep. So as we're covering stuff, changing gears, going from, you know, we, we cover everything in planning, then we do everything in exit, and, and it, you know, it goes down by process group, which could even be more, you know, confusing if you haven't studied everything in an area and we're just bypassing all the areas that you know and getting to stuff you don't, it could, it could be a little bit, um, so yeah, Shri, come on, come on board then. I think that will be good. And I think I answered the last of these basic questions about how to prepare for the exam. Yes, I did. Okay. Well, I want to appreciate you guys. Thank you very much for joining. And thank you for sticking with me, you know, regarding all those issues we had earlier. And if there are any more questions, I would really love to take them right now. So if you had one question that you're thinking, oh, I wonder if I should ask this. Is, will I be bothering Phil? No, you won't be bothering me. This is what I'm built to do, to answer your questions. That's why it's called PMP brunch time. I ate this thing for lunch. <laughs> of course, with a drink to go with it. Okay, zero calorie, I must say. Okay. So, no further questions. I want to say a massive thank you to you. Thank you for all your questions. Shri, Maya, Annie, thank you very much. Jake Paul for the humor. Carlos, thank you very much. Um, health uh, correction, thank you very much for that. Carlos, everyone, appreciate you guys. Don't forget, we have these every now and again. Biren, thank you very much as well. We have, have these every now and again. So if you've got any questions, the best thing to do will be to post them to this video or you can post them to my Facebook page. Those of you who have not followed on Facebook, you might wanna do that, because every now and again, I have live sessions that are not um, advertised. So I'm gonna post my Facebook page. And for those of you who like a little bit of entertainment, if you look out for me on Instagram, You'll find me there every now and again, just being goofy. All right, so I appreciate you guys. I look forward to seeing you on another video, and I look forward to more questions from you. All the best in your prep. Don't stop studying. Hit it hard. Go crazy on this stuff. You got to be wild to ace the test, okay? Take care, and bye for now.